Welcome to Inaudible. My name is Jeremy Wylan, and I'm still not joined by my co-host, Ryan Masterson. Now, I wanted to just give everybody a little update. Uh, we don't have a regular uh, podcast episode for you today, but I wanted to uh, check in and uh, just update you on some events you may be interested in. First of all, I'd like to let you know that I spoke with Ryan uh, on Friday, I think, and uh, got to FaceTime with him and his new daughter, Thea, and it sounds like she's doing great and uh, the family's doing great. As you've probably noticed, Living Love and Light episodes have started to come out again, so I'm hopeful that once... Uh, Ryan just gets caught up on sleep and everything. Uh, we're going to have him again, and we're going to hear all about what being a daddy twice over is like. So uh, looking forward to that, but I don't have a date still. I'm just giving you the information that I have. The second update is that we are pleased to announce at the Other Selves Working Group that we are beginning to release transcripts of the channeling sessions we conducted in July and August this year. Uh, we wanted to vet these messages for polarity, for being non-infringing, and for just being useful generally. And the feedback that we've got is that it's worth publishing. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and do that. I've got three transcripts up at the uh, site we're using as a repository for publishing all of this content. And the address for that site is H-A-R-C as in cat dot other selves working dot group. And that H-A-R-C stands for the High Altitude Receiving Center. And that's the name that we've come up with for our repository of channeled messages. So uh, I encourage you to go to harc.otherselvesworking.group and check it out. I wrote up a little uh, introduction or about page that kind of talks about our concept of channeling, um, sort of the principles by which it operates, and... Um, what we do to make sure we're bringing through the highest and best of which we're capable. So that's exciting. And there will be, uh, I think there's three transcripts up there now. Uh, we captured 11 out of 12 sessions that weekend. So there's going to be like eight more coming. And I just want to, uh, you know, do a final check on them, make sure the transcript matches the audio and, uh, you know, little typos and stuff like that. I'm still finding them, so it's just a work in progress. Um, and that's a good, the, the, the point about audio is good because uh, I'm actually linking to audio. So if you prefer to listen to this stuff, I cannot vouch for how well processed it is. Um, one of the things about channeling in Colorado Springs in July and August without uh, <laughs> air conditioning in the house is that we're running the fans and uh, you hear that. But you should be able to make it out. Um, I think there was only really one part of any of the audio recordings that I simply could not make out and had to use uh, the title of this podcast uh, in, a, in a way that, uh, you know, it's supposed to be used for uh, to mark sections of a transcript where the audio was inaudible. So I'm excited about that. Uh, hope you are too. And uh, please, you know, let, let us know if you have any feedback on these messages. Um, I'm certainly willing to hear it. Uh, okay. So there was one other thing that I thought I might uh, record about uh, as a solo act. Um, and this is something that I mentioned in the last episode with Nithin Reddy about the Lord's Prayer. Now, listeners, I'm not the hugest Christian in the world. Um, of course, as a white male in America who grew up in a white family, uh, I was baptized, you know, Christian. I, I happened to be baptized Presbyterian, but never really went to a Presbyterian church. Um, went to a bunch of different churches growing up. My parents were kind of into an eclectic mix of Christianity and 
uh, Metaphysics, Course in Miracles, Casey, what have you. And so uh, Christianity was something that kind of was, you know, hinted at. It was all around. Uh, I did Bible studies when I went to church, but, you know, nothing really ever like stuck with me. It just kind of becomes the background cultural norm that you deal with. I feel like in this, in this society, uh, a lot of the times, and that's a shame, um, because there's a lot of rich information there that if taken seriously, I mean, you don't need to take my word for it. Lots of people have been helped by the, by the example and the message of Jesus Christ. Um, but I've been expi- I've been inspired by Carla's example and the way that she uh, blended uh, her Christian faith and the uh, sort of, you know, principles of Christianity with Confederation teaching. And I think she uh, did that to great effect. And there's uh, one area where I found it particularly useful, and it is in using the Lord's Prayer. Uh, that simple prayer that Jesus taught uh, followers to pray. And uh, I kind of use it several times a day, and I use it the same way that a lot of Buddhists will go through the the points of meditation or the points of posture or uh, like the Buddhists often have like, you know, there, there, there's four kinds of illusion or stuff like that. And the idea is that going through each of these uh, opens the mind to an aspect of that concept that you might not have appreciated. So it's a way to kind of like remind yourself of these different aspects of experience or of whatever concept you're dealing with. And I have found that the Lord's Prayer serves this purpose for me very well. Um, I was inspired to look into this and to really think deeply about utilizing the prayer in my meditative and ritual practices uh, by, there's at least one Confederation transcript that deals with the Lord's Prayer. So the first time that I uh, read (laughs) uh, a Confederation source talk about this was, uh, let's see, July 27th, 1980. This is a Hatan session. I believe it's already been covered by Ryan on the LLL podcast, but um, it made an impact on me and gave me some ideas on how I could use the Lord's Prayer, how I could think about it. And the reason that this in Christianity in general has become more and more important to me is because I believe that the Christian message in part, but a very important part, is about um, mind yielding to spirit and manifesting through the body. So the idea is that in the same way that channeling is an opening to spirit in order to bring through words and you have to condition the mind to be a good receptacle for uh, what spirit wants to share. Uh, I believe that this is, generally speaking, uh, what Christianity is all about and what Jesus taught. Um, By aligning one's will with the Creator's will, we become an instrument for the Creator uh, to make, uh, you know, heaven on earth. Uh, not in some forceful way or in some way where we control and prescribe things, but instead uh, as a way that our actions introduce a dynamic of vibration and energy into a uh, consensus reality that can plant a seed in other people and that can help other people and be there for them. I believe deeply that this is a big part of the symbolism of Christianity, uh, the triune God, um, I believe that it is part of why uh, the Ankh, uh, the the Egyptian symbol that Ra mentions in uh, the Ra Contact, uh, has some resemblance to the cross that usually uh, uh, is used to represent Christianity. To me, that's not simply an artifact of the crucifixion. Uh, I'm drawing upon uh, information that comes from Ray Stanford's Fatima Prophecy uh, channelings, where they talk about the fact that it's not just like a T or like a a, a balanced cross. Uh, The cross 
actually the 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 where the place where the uh, intersection occurs is higher up on the vertical line, and uh, in Ray Stanford's work that is meant to symbolize um, the throat chakra, which in their uh, cosmology or in his symbology uh, represented the will. So the idea of the Christian faith is yielding one's personal ego will to the creator and, and its will so that its work can be done. And the way that I unify that with uh, Confederation philosophy is that um, when we discover who we truly are, when we know ourselves, accept ourselves, and become the creator, uh, we discover that the creator's will is our will. We discover that we are the creator, and therefore what we really want, what our desires really boil down to, is to do the creator's will, to be one with the creator, and to do that in action, right? To not have it just be a nice idea uh, that is potential and in intelligent infinity, but to be part of the intelligent energy that brings that into manifestation, that uh, being a seeker, that being... Uh, attuned to the creator's will is about bringing that will into the world and to do it in this humble way where it isn't really us that is acting. We are transparent and letting the creator's light through. So these are all just like little tidbits I'm throwing out there to sort of justify, you know, my idea of why Christianity might be useful to you. So this July 27th, 1980 uh, session is worth looking at because the first because it was the first time that I really started getting uh, attuned to this idea of what it could mean for me in my practice. Um, and I'll just uh, excerpt the part that talks about the Lord's Prayer, but this is uh, Hatan, July twenty seventh, nineteen eighty. We know that you are all familiar with a prayer that many of you have learned as children, which is called the Lord's Prayer. And we wonder if you might not reconsider this prayer with the understanding that we may have to offer. For it is truly a central and worthwhile teaching of one of your great teachers. But it has been much misunderstood by your peoples, for it has led them to believe that there is an entity outside of themselves, bearing no resemblance or connection to themselves, to whom they pray and beseech assistance. My friends, to the best of our understanding, this is not so. This prayer begins, Our Father, which art in heaven, that is to say, love, which is in light. Hallowed be thy name. This is to say, holy be the name of creation, the word that means all that there is. Thy kingdom come, the kingdom of love. Thy will be done, the will of love, on earth as it is in heaven, as it is in heaven, the kingdom of love. Give us this day our daily bread. You must ask for this, my friends, as a symbol for all of the needs and supplies of the illusion. For in the physical body you have many needs which must be fulfilled, food and drink and shelter. But love is the source of all supply, and it is inaudible. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. May love prevail, both in the giving of forgiveness and the gracious acceptance of the forgiveness of others for the wrongs which you have done. This, my friends, is perhaps the hardest of the phrases to live, inaudible. For some, it is difficult to forgive, but for most, it is easier to forgive than be forgiven. For you do not wish to understand this love, and to understand that you are in need of love, that you have not, without love, become the perfect being that you can be, and that you are in reality. You are so caught up in the illusion, my friends, that you forget how foolish it is, how foolish each entity is as he reacts within that illusion. But we ask you to forgive, and more than this, we ask you to accept your own failings, and to accept the forgiveness of yourself and others when you have failed to manifest perfection. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You are aware, my friends, that you yourself planned the lessons that you would learn in this lifetime. 
Each of those lessons requires a testing, and each testing will be difficult. As you pray to love, it is not that you ask to avoid the lessons, but that you ask the grace of love, the spirit of that which is light, to enter into you and to lead you in a wiser, higher self that protects you from misunderstanding the test and from misperceiving the test. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And whose is thine, my friends? To whom do we think of? The kingdom is part of ourselves. That which you know as Christ consciousness is as a spark that dwells within each of us. To center yourself upon the Christ within is to then be perfectly poised for action in any direction, in any way that may be needed. It is to have your burden lifted, that you may be light of heart and merry and full of love for mankind. We ask you in your meditations and your actions, my friends, to find this love and to see this love not only in your friends but in the homeless and those who have no friends and those who are troubled. They need Christ's love and you can offer yourself. You need not say or do anything to be radiant with the love of Christ's consciousness, as you may wish to call it. For if you are centered in service and in love, all those who need you will be drawn to you, and all that they need from you will be given. So that's the end of the excerpt uh, dealing with the Lord's Prayer that I wanted to read, and it gives you some ideas on how you can uh, think about this prayer. Um, I don't quite necessarily resonate with every single symbological concept in there. Uh, to me, there's uh, some other things that uh, make more sense to me and that I use. And so I want to share them with you, uh, not as, you know, this is the right way to do it, um, but as an idea on how you can use things like a simple common Christian prayer to enliven your meditation, to enliven your uh, contemplation of the divine and of your place in it. So, and, and there definitely are parts of Hatan's uh, <laughs> uh, translation, so to speak, uh, that I took with me that 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 helped me, and I'll mention those. So, uh, the way that I use it is I start Our Father, and I think that Our Father is very important, not for the father part, but for the our part. If you recall, this prayer is always done in the plural. We are praying. Even when you pray by yourself, you don't say my father who art in heaven. You say our father. And I like this because it reminds us that we aren't alone in this seeking, that this seeking is not solely about our individual project. Uh, we are part of a collective. We are part of a society of a vast brother and sisterhood of entities throughout the creation, all of them seeking to do uh, the will of the creator uh, and trying to find ways to refine and crystallize the self so that we can be ready for that. And I like that thought. It, rem it pulls me out of myself and it uh, just reminds me who it is that is surrounding me, that these are parts of the creator just like me, who are striving just like me, and who need comfort at least as much as I do. So our Father, who art in heaven. Now, here's where uh, my interpretation gets a little bit different than Hatan's. I think of heaven as intelligent infinity, uh, the unmanifest, the great plenum of potential that exists outside of manifestation, outside of the manifest reality of intelligent uh, energy. Um, and I think that is our, in some ways, our true home uh, in the great uh, sort of repository of potential and ideas and undifferentiation that, you know, is unity. It is only in this manifest world that we uh, kind of partake of uh, separate concepts like, you know, space and time that allow for this separation and this drama of being at unity 
having an experience of seeming separation and coming back. All of these things are made possible uh, because they were dreamed up first as potentials in intelligent infinity. And that is where uh, our source is. So uh, our Father who art in heaven, um, our Creator who, who uh, exists in intelligent infinity, hallowed be thy name. When they talk about the name, I interpret that as the word. Uh, if you remember uh, in the New Testament, the word was the thing that created reality. And I conceive of that as the breath of the creator, this, this, this uh, wind that, that uh, creation uh, consisted of, that imbalanced things and created this whole illusion that could sort of started the ball rolling. Um, that powerful word that is the name of the creator by which, uh, in some accounts, Jesus healed by the word. And in some accounts of other practices, the name of God is this very uh, powerful, uh, earth-shaking principle uh, to invoke. So our Father, our creator who uh, lies in intelligent infinity, hallowed and honored be that uh, breath that pervades all of our manifest illusion. That's kind of how I see that. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is, uh, to me, an uh, appeal uh, to, the, to the will of the Creator, to align our will with the Creator, and to make uh, the will of the Creator that, that perfect pattern uh, that, that represents the creator's will to bring that into manifestation. Uh, so we are taking the potential of intelligent infinity and manifesting it into the kinetic of the manifest illusion. Give us this day, our daily bread. I see that very similarly to the way that Hatan sees it. Uh, this is our chance to, relate to the creator in a way that allows for our limited self to be acknowledged, to be acknowledged uh, for its needs, uh, for its frailty. Uh, and I think it is good. I think it is proper for us to ask for what we need and to understand, like Hatan said, that love is the source of all of this, uh, that our needs uh, can be dealt with on a day by day basis, that we we often tie ourselves in knots um, and invoke a great deal of fear when we plan too far ahead in the future or we try to make things happen. Uh, instead, it might be better uh, for us to have a moment in the day where we ask for what we need, as children do of their, of their father or mother, uh, that we have faith that that need will be fulfilled by them it's somehow, some way. And it doesn't mean that we don't uh, take action uh, in our lives to get what we, what we need to, to make sure we have shelter and food and money and whatever it is that this silly illusion requires of us. Uh, it just means that we recognize where it comes from and therefore that we need not fear and contract and start serving the self for those needs. So give us this day our daily bread, uh, ensure that our needs are fulfilled for our uh, uh, bodies and uh, souls in this illusion. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. To me, this is uh, pretty much exactly how Hatan says, and it's, uh, I think they couldn't, I think I couldn't put it better than they did. Uh, it is important that we take a moment to think about what it is that we might want to forgive in ourselves, uh, what we might want the creator to forgive us for, what we might want other selves to forgive us for, to acknowledge that. Much as uh, Catholics use the confession and the confessing of sins, not to beat themselves over the head and, and, and flog themselves for what they've done wrong, but as a way to touch in to the lessons that they are capable of learning through this forgiveness. Uh, the forgiveness is 
the culmination of the lesson in a lot of ways. It is the grounding of whatever was learned about the creation and the creator uh, in our lives. And it kind of uh, grounds it down into our souls when we pay it the respect of this attention. And of course, there is the part about forgiving others. And uh, as Satan says, that is often easier. But it's also worth taking a moment to think about what it is that we might forgive, how we might uh, dispense this gift of love and forgiveness to those who we feel may have wronged us in some way. It's, uh, it's, not, it's not merely a trivial thing. It is, it is worth pausing on each of these points uh, at some point in the day. You know, even if you don't use the Lord's Prayer to uh, remember to think of these things, they're worth thinking of, right? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So I also agree with Hatan on that. Uh, and it was Hatan that really, in, in, in interpreting this part, this was the, the part that really made me think that the Lord's Prayer might be useful to me on a daily basis. Now, I, I'd say it multiple times a day now. Um, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That sounds so Bible thumper, right? Uh, fire and brimstone, but I like Hatan's interpretation. We are here to learn lessons, and they present themselves in ways that sometimes because of the details, because of how they mix with uh, the concerns of our lives, we may not recognize them as lessons at all. And so this is a request to not, to, to, when, we, when we ask to not be led into temptation, we're asking, I'm asking at least, <laughs> uh, not to be uh, fooled by the, by the mask that the situation, that the person, whatever, uh, shows to me. To recognize that there's a deeper current that I'm participating in, and that at that level, there is something that I can benefit from in this experience. If I can tap into that, then I can learn the lesson, and I can be delivered from you know, the quote unquote evil of having to repeat that lesson over and over again, right? Like, uh, it's, it's the, again, the fire and brimstone stuff. I mean, remember this was a prayer invented 2000 years ago. Uh, we can now understand and have a more, uh, nuanced interpretation of these things. And I, and I encourage you to, to, to think about what your own interpretation might be. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. This is, uh, of course, related to the Kabbalistic cross um, and uh, the Essene ritual of, uh, you know, doing this cross uh, in ritual magic um, and in the, the, you know, Western ceremonial magic. Um I, I just think of it as an extremely powerful invocation that is often done very flippantly. Um, but it is a reminder to me that whatever I am seeking to achieve, whatever progress I'm seeking to make spiritually, however I am conceiving of myself in relation to the creation and the creator, whatever it is that I accomplish, it is not for my purposes. It is not something that, it's not a notch in my belt. It's not a, a medal on my breast. It is not something that I use to accrue glory to myself. It is all for the creator. And in thinking that way, in thinking that we are offering up what we learn, we are offering up uh, how we fail, we are offering up all of our experience to the creator, for its benefit, and knowing that whatever benefit we get comes through the Creator, right? Things come through positive entities, as Ross says, not to them. And this, to me, uh, reinforces that concept. Um, so that's kind of my interpretation of it. It's how I use it, and I find it very, uh, 
a very good way to start the day uh, in my meditation. So I just thought, uh, since I don't have an interview, I don't have uh, uh, Ryan on the horn, uh, I just thought I'd share that with you as uh, a little mini episode uh, to take with you. Hopefully you'll find it something that's uh, worth listening to uh, for 30 minutes. But anyway, uh, I'm going to go ahead and leave it there. Uh, I'm trying like heck to line up another guest, but that may not happen. And if, if that doesn't happen, uh, I'll think of something else to talk about because I'm not very uh, confident doing just solo uh, podcast episodes. I like having the dynamic tension, if you will, <laughs> of a co-host or a guest. But uh, you know, maybe I need to stretch out and see how these things work. Uh, and if you have any ideas, uh, of things to talk about, um, I would love to hear them. You know where to reach me, uh, inaudible.show is our website and there's a contact form, uh, use it. Nothing would please me more than to hear from listeners, to hear how their lives are going, what questions they might have that, uh, we might be able to share a conversation about. And I might be able to talk about and give you something useful. Maybe not. After all, it's a free podcast. (laughs) So anyway, uh, I will uh, always keep you folks posted on goings on and things you need to know about. And uh, I appreciate your patience with us as we uh, wait out Ryan's paternity leave. But I'm sure that will uh, we'll be back to normal soon. In the meantime, my friends, stay in the love and light.